Hey everybody, welcome back. Episode three, Ramsey's Rock and Roads. Shout out to Isabella, thanks for the name. We love it. Shane doesn't love it so much, but I do. <laughs> anyway, we're gonna carry on where we left off. Uh, I think last episode I had just hired my first estimator and I'm pulling my hair out like crazy, going back and forth, running jobs, estimating myself, meeting with customers. So let's take it away. I'm here with Shane again. Comrade in this uh, crazy world we call YouTube and podcast. Take it away, Shane. So in 2003, John joins RACC as an estimator. Uh, what were some challenges during this period? Okay, well, as, as with anything, when you hire a, an employee, well, let's go back. When I hired my first employees, I... I have dual roles at, roles at that point. I'm a contractor, but now I just became, by default, a manager. So I was learning how to manage guys out in the field, and like I said, and uh, I think it was episode two, I said, there's times where I would give the guys the best well laid planned out in the world, and then for some reason they still screwed it up. So, you know, hiring an estimator or a salesperson is no different. Me being this young kid, I'm 20, 21 years old, 22 years old at this time, uh, maybe, no, I don't even think I was 22 years old. I think I was 20 at the time. Hiring my first estimator who could, is old enough to be my father. <laughs> John, if you're watching this, don't, don't, be, too, don't be too hard on yourself. But uh, anyway, I mean, I'm hiring, I hired an estimator old enough to be my dad. And I, his kids are my age. I, you know, shout out to David, Megan, and Spencer. Hope you guys are well. Hey, Chris. Um, but... But yeah, uh, and John, hope you're retire. Hope you're enjoying retirement. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Uh, but yeah, here I am, this kid trying to figure out how to manage guys, manage a crew, manage myself. And now I threw into the mix managing a sales guy. And initially, I mean, I assume well, John had been running his own company, and he'd do a fine job for me. So initially. He, I just threw him out there and he went out there and sold jobs and, uh, um, and yeah, he went out there, sold jobs. He was responsible for the estimates, the quotations. Uh, first mistake I think is, is he was responsible for profitability, but in also, but also he was a commission sales guy. And though <clears throat> that's a bad, bad, I found early on and thank, thankfully I did, I found out early on that that's a bad combination. Not that anybody is will maliciously do anything wrong, and not that John was John stayed with me and up until his retirement, which it was a pleasure and an honor to work with him for literally 20 years. But when somebody's a commissioned salesperson and they feel like they need to provide for themselves and they feel like they need to provide for the company and they feel like they need to provide for the guys working for the company sometimes things can get a little, there's a little bit of a gray area there. And <clears throat> to close a deal, they might, you know, skimp a little bit on it. And there was several times where we'd go out and do work and John estimated 12 tons in the job and I'm out there doing the work and I'm like, John, we're gonna use 25 tons on the job or he, quit, he figured 20 tons and we use 50 tons on the job. And so there was a lot of that happening to where I had to learn how to manage John and the way I did it is I just reeled it back in and I said okay John you go out you figure out you do a takeoff I want you to be a full-on salesperson you do a takeoff bring it back I'll 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 figure out our hard our hard costs I'll figure out profitability I'll figure out overhead and then I'll input it into QuickBooks and so once we did that once I rein, reined it back in and, 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 and John got his butt chewed a few times because, hey, how can you be that far off? 20 tons and we use 50 tons or 12 tons of skin patching and we use 25 tons of skin, like double. After a couple butt chewings, you know, he figured it out. But there was, a, there was a learning curve where John had to figure out, not only was I learning how to manage John, but he also had to figure out my expectations and what people feel about Ramsey Asphalt. Ramsey Asphalt and Pacific Coast Asphalt were two different companies, two different visions, and both companies were going in different directions. John was on stability mode because of his years in the business. I'm on growth mode, 
And growing a company, there are certain things you that there are certain things that customers expect, and you know people just expect it. Just as now, people expect more from Ramsey Asphalt. People expect more from the company because it, just because of, of of what Ramsey Asphalt stands for. You know, they're not they don't want to go to a cut rate guy. If they wanted to go to a cut rate guy, they would have went with a cut rate guy, and they would have got the one inch overlay, but they said, Hey, we want, we want it. We are here for the long term. We want a good job. We want a good investment. Not that anybody else out there is doing bad job. It's just, you know, we are us contractors know that there are those guys, those guys out there that, you know, they're, they don't really work. They're not worried about tomorrow. They're worried about right now. They're worried about the money right now. And you know, they'll, they'll do a half an inch of asphalt over alligated areas and they won't look back. Are they going to be in business tomorrow? I don't know. It's not, that's none of my business and, and I can't answer that for them. But, you know, uh, it's just for, for the long term, I don't want to have to look back. I don't want to have to look over my shoulder. So I reined John back in, started doing estimates in-house, started doing the proposals in-house. And that took a lot, that took away a lot of the, a lot of the gray area. So fire away, Shane. Did you consider any other office support during this period? And how are you maintaining collection and payables? Okay, office personnel, that's, yeah, that's, uh, as contractors, we, we can do it all ourselves, right? We can do everything ourselves. And yeah, no, I mean, for a long time there, I mean, obviously my, my wife at the time, she was there still monkeying around with the bills and, and trying to figure all the, floundering with that. And I'm still using QuickBooks for estimates and invoicing, which we still do, we still do to this day. Um, but yeah, we still had no office personnel. It was just me and John and, and, um, you know, whatever my ex did, she did and wasn't a whole lot, but yeah, a lot, I mean, there was a lot of weight on mine and John's shoulders. And, and the funny thing was, is John in his career with an asphalt, within asphalt, he was one of the best roller guys in the business. And we would get on these jobs and me and John, John, I'm on the paver with the guys. I'm on the paver running the job and, and uh, John's behind me rolling. And, and we did that. We did that for years. I mean, for many, many years. What was the second part of that question, Shane? Uh, how are you maintaining collection and payables? Oh, okay. Uh, collection and payables. Um, I mean, and I hate to say it, but collection was we were living Friday by Friday by Friday by Friday. And me running Ramsey Asphalt three, four years later into the company, I was no different than I was having a job before. I was living from Friday to Friday to Friday. Well, hell, why didn't I just stay working for somebody and I guarantee a check on Friday? So anyway, still trying to figure things out. And, and the biggest thing, trying to figure out the money part and so it was just a matter of, I mean, obviously we had payroll on Friday and that was always first and foremost. We had to figure out how to make payroll. And it was just a matter of, I would sit down and see what invoices were open and then I would just start calling people. Hey, can I come by and pick up a check? Or John would call people, hey, can we come by and pick up a check? You know, we got, we got payroll on Friday and somehow, and I, I cannot tell you how, because there was some real dark times that at, at there, there have been many, many, many dark times within the history of Ramsey Asphalt, but we've always been able to make payroll. And I look back on the years and I, I really don't know how, but this is where the undying faith comes in that you're going to be okay. As long as you're going out doing the right thing, willing to work hard, things somehow work out. I don't know how that works. I don't know how nature works like that. And I'm still trying to figure it out, but we never missed a payroll. Now there's a lot of vendors we didn't get paid. And there's a lot of, in my early years, there was a lot. I mean, I had my, I had my account at Granite suspended. I had my account at Cal Portland and Hanson. And a lot of these companies actually for many years, Granite closed my account. And I, I didn't have an account at Granite. They just said, hey, you're too hard to get money out of. Forget it. Hanson, the same thing. Uh, Union Asphalt, the same thing. Cal Portland, the same thing. I mean, I would just bounce around from, from vendor to vendor to vendor. Uh, same thing with my seal coat suppliers. I, you know, I couldn't pay a bill there, so I'd have to go buy seal coat from somebody else. And it was a really, uh, really a stressful time. It was definitely a really a stressful time. But it was just a matter of, uh, keeping the collections going. And as we did estimates and we did work, I would invoice the work 
and there was really no synergy there uh, with with the way the way things are now, and we'll get into that in later episodes. But there was no synergy there. There was no real full circle of life where where you go from estimating to doing the job to invoicing to inputting bills once the job gets paid then you pay those job bills with those monies back in those days there was none of that happening it was literally literally rob peter to pay paul and it was rob peter it might not even be rob peter to pay paul it might be rob peter to pay sally and then i'll rob sally to pay peter again and it was yeah it was a it was quite the quite quite the conundrum so uh hopefully i answered that question for you guys what do we got next shane uh transitioning into 2008 yeah so market was crashing yeah <laughs> yeah that's uh so here we are here we are we're plugging away and in the early years i'm trying to figure things out and the funny thing was, as I was, as I was learning and growing and listening to self-help and meeting people and going to seminars and learning and, and, and watching Zig Ziglar and, oh God, I want to, I want to be like that. I want to, I want to be the number one guy in the company and the number two guy in the company. And, and as I, as I was learning and growing, the funny thing was, and there's, there's a, there's a, an Eastern phrase that says, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And that is really the story of my life. Because every time I was ready, a new speaker would come up and somebody would, somebody, somebody would come along and say, hey, have you ever heard of Wayne Dyer? No, I've never heard of Wayne Dyer. Or Deepak Chopra, no, I've never heard of Deepak. Or, or Napoleon Hill or Andrew Carnegie. And, no, I've never heard of these guys. Now, if, if Scott Santella early on when I talked about my, the changing of my life and me changing going from an introverted asphalt guy to an extroverted salesperson, if he had suggested Napoleon Hill at the time, I would have listened to five minutes of it and I would have thrown it in the garbage because it would have all been way over my head. But because the student wasn't ready and because the student wasn't ready, the teacher didn't appear. And I was handed the very most basic cassette that Zig Ziglar has. And since then, he has, he has sets that are 8, 10, 12, 24 hours, 36 hours long. And they're very intensive. And I've listened to all of them. And, but I wasn't ready for it at the time. And so, so as, as I grew as a person, new, new teachers would appear. And so certain teachers would come along and, and I would learn about systems. And so getting into 2005, 2006, 2007, I started learning about these systems and how I can take a lot of pressure off myself and relieve a lot of stress from my life if I instill these systems. Now the system could be as simple as, hey guys, we fill up at the gas station every afternoon when we come back from the job, no matter what. That's the system that we do. Because we don't have to worry about filling up at the gas station in the morning because the gas pumps are, aren't working, the electricity is out. If we instill that one system where we fill up at the end of the day every day, if the gas pumps are out and the, all the power's out in Santa Maria, then we can make a plan for the morning. However, if we already have a plan for the day and we go to fuel up, fuel up, and the, and the plants are and the fuel station is down, then we're scrambling. Then it's a complete nightmare, and we're starting off our day on the wrong foot. So as I started learning and becoming a better manager when it comes to the guys, and it becomes to the crew, and it be and I become a better manager for John, then I started learning about systems. And here we go into 2004, 2005 housing market is crazy the developers are building houses they're they're building and selling houses they're selling houses quicker than they could build them and 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 if you're a contractor and you're halfway decent there's tons of work out there and so we really weren't working all that hard for the work that we did get and so 2005 was great 2006 was great 2007 we, I'm gonna say we did 2007, we were up to 10 employees, 12 employees, some buying some new equipment, had a fancy brand new Lee Boy paving machine sitting at the yard. 
weren't using it all that often, but hey, it was still at the yard and it was nice, a nice ego boost to have that brand new paver sitting at the yard. And uh, we, in 2007, we had our biggest year ever. And we're talking about now, I mean, I, I took the company from doing $250,000 a year and now we're just under 4 million within a very, very relatively short period of time. And uh, by this time I had already gone through a divorce. So uh, my ex and I are running the company together and it was okay in the beginning, things were all right. Um, but then really the thing that was an awful thing, but it was a really, it was a, it was a blessing. And, and those of you that have listened to me before know that 2008 really caused me to embrace change because I realized that with such a drastic change, which, which, which came from 2008, um, there, yeah, it was in the, initially it was very, very negative, but it had very, very profound positive outcomes when we were spit at the spit out at the end of the tunnel. And so that's 2008 was a huge crossroads for me in my life. And I learned so much about myself. I learned so much about business. Um, and so, but I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit because here comes 2008 and I think the rug was pulled out from underneath everybody. I mean, we lost overnight, we lost a million dollars of overhead and that million dollars is what was covering overhead went away in an instant. And so I had to regroup and had to really, I had to, I joke around with people and I say, I started the company in 1999 and I've been running it this whole time but I really didn't become a business person until 2008. And I really had to look at everything. And I don't know if I really should be saying this on the air, but at this point in time, by robbing Peter to pay Paul and robbing Peter to pay Sally and then look, trying to figure out how to pay Paul later on, I ended up getting myself into a pickle where I owed a bunch of money to a bunch of, bunch of vendors and, um, Cal Portland, Cal Portland, bless their soul, because I still have, I still have an account at Cal Portland. I do a lot of business with Cal Portland. I owed Cal Portland a million dollars. Literally, I owed them a million dollars, and I had no idea how I was going to get them paid. And they were, they had a manager at the time, Jerry, and she was very wise. And I think deep down inside, she knew if she closed my account, how was I ever going to be paid the million dollars? How are they ever going to get paid the million dollars back? And she kept me on a really, really, really tight leash for many, many years. And it was a matter of, you know, and they kept my account open. We did joint checks and we figured it out. We really, we all, we all worked together and we all figured it out. And at the end of the day, we came out, we came out at the other end stronger, but it was, it was, it was quite the struggle. It was definitely quite the struggle. Was there some other questions regarding those times? Yes. Okay. So why didn't you just declare bankruptcy at that time? Yeah. Good question. Good question. So, um, my, my business partner. So now, now we've now, uh, now my ex-wife has gone from, uh, um, <laughs> ex-wife or wife to ex-wife. Now, now I just say now refer to her as business partner at the time, because really that's what we were. And things were so dire during this 2008, 2009 timeframe that all of my friends, all of my family, everybody said, Scott, you got to just BK this thing. It is a sinking ship and it is going to drag you to the bottom with it. And even Lori said, even my, my, uh, my uh, ex-business partner, ex-wife, she said, Scott, so she drugged me to several attorneys and we sat down with these attorneys and their, their bank, bankruptcy attorneys, that's what they specialize in. We sat down with these guys and they gave me a structure and they said, Scott, we can, we can bankrupt this thing. You got a fresh start and this is how we're gonna do it. And I listened to what all of them had to say and I said, you know what guys, there is no way that anybody is ever gonna consider doing business with me again, ever, if I bankrupt Ramsey Asphalt. There's, credibility at stake, my integrity is at stake, and there is no way that anybody would ever consider doing business with me if I bankrupt them. So, and I told all these attorneys, I said, thank you very much. Everybody thought I was a fool. 
uh, my business partner, she was freaking out. She just got married again, had a new, and, and she had a, a newborn baby at the time, or the, or she was pregnant with the baby. I, I don't remember exactly if, if, if Callie had been born at the time yet, but uh, she had it. So, so her life was changing. She was scared. And I finally just went to everybody and I said, guys, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to, we are going to just have to figure it out and we're going to have to make a plan with everybody. And at this time, uh, we still did not have our, we weren't utilizing QuickBooks the way we should have. Um, my partner, my ex-partner's uh, mom was doing our bills, doing all of our accounts payables and she had no experience doing it and she was a complete mess she bless her heart she was doing a great job but she had no accounting or no uh, bookkeeping experience and so once again it was just a constant struggle and during this time and and i think the one thing that that i got out of the 2008 2009 2010 era was in the asphalt business there's it's really, really easy to cheat. And I can't tell you guys how many times I was on a paving machine where somebody paid me for a two inch overlay and I so desperately needed the money to where it would have been really, really easy for me to skinny up that mat to inch and a half. Now going from, for those of you guys out there, management companies, and you don't really know a whole lot about the asphalt industry, when you go from an inch and a half, when, you're, when you think you're buying two inches, and you're really sold an inch and a half, you are talking about tens of thousands of dollars, literally. I mean, obviously, depending on the size of the job, but the size of the jobs that we were doing at this point, um, yeah, you're talking, if I skinnied up a half an inch of asphalt on the entire parking lot, you're talking about maybe not tens of thousands of dollars, but maybe several, five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars $8,000. And now the kinds of jobs that Ramsey Asphalt's doing to this day, if we skinnied up a half an inch on all these jobs, now you're talking about tens of thousands of dollars, even hundreds of thousands of dollars throughout the year. So back in the back in those days in 2008, 2009, 2010, my my I was always confronted with, hey, just this one time, just this one time. And I remember having the conversations with myself on the paving machine saying, Scott, it's not going to hurt. Nobody's looking. Nobody knows just this one time but I would always fight back with the little devil and the little devil and angel that's on my shoulder and I'm fighting with these guys saying yeah but I know I know it's not right I know it's not right and so there was always these times where I really desperately like my, my conscience would grab a hold of me and smack me around a little bit and say Scott get those out, get those thoughts out of your mind you're not going to sell the guy three inches and give him two and a half inches or you're not going to sell him a two inch overlay and give him an inch and a half it's not going to happen and we never did and thankfully we didn't because like i said in episode one or two now i'm getting a little confused and that's my older age catching up with me in one of those episodes i said that i'm in it for the long haul and when i went to those lawyers those bankruptcy attorneys and i said guys thank you but no thanks i'm going to figure this out for myself and i did and I went, we went back to the lab again and we went to the drawing board and we were constantly going back to the drawing board. Really, it was just me and John and the guys. And we were out there just doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. And, and but we never compromised quality. We never compromised quality. And there were certain times where I had to let my ego go. And I said, okay, I'm going to do a good job for this guy. But you know what? Tomorrow I've got a truck that's getting repoed. I could have saved that repo from happening by skinning up on this job, collecting the money and just go pay cash for the truck and get it out of repo. But no, I'm giving, I'm giving Sally the best imaginable job I can and I'm going to let that truck get repoed and I'll figure it out later. And that's what happened. Trucks were getting repoed, equipment was getting repoed. And, and what I did at this time, what I, what I did at this time to make it right with people is I would call Ford, Ford Motor Company. And I have a wonderful relationship with Ford now. And I really believe it was because of the, uh, because of decisions I made back in 2008, 2009, 2010, I would call Ford Motor Company and say, Ford, I can't pay for this vehicle. I want to do a voluntary surrender. It's just a real fancy way of saying it got repoed. So I would say, I want to do a voluntary surrender. I can't pay for this truck anymore. 
how can I help you to get it to auction? Let's figure out what we can sell it for and I'll pay you the difference. And they were happy about that. So then it would go, these trucks and equipment would go to auction, they would get repoed and I would help the repo guys load up the trucks as I'm crying. And so I'd help them load up the trucks and you know, they were saying, you know, they, they saw I wasn't a bad guy and they were apologizing to me as I'm apologizing to them as I'm crying as, the tr as, the, as my trucks are driving away. All the while my guys knew in the field that I was getting stuff repossessed and they were just, and I know what they were thinking. Hey, I hope I get a check on Friday, which believe it or not, they always got a check on Friday. I don't know how, but they did. And what would happen at this point in time is, and I don't know if any of you guys out there have ever been through the, the repo process. It's not very fun, but what happens is, the let's use Ford Motor Company as an example. Ford Motor Company comes and picks up the truck. They don't want the truck back. It's been used, it's got asphalt, it's got crap all over it. They send it to auction. They see what they can sell it for. So if they sell it for 25,000, but I owe 30,000, then they call me up and they say, hey, Scott, Mr. Ramsey, uh, we sold your truck at auction. We got 25,000 for it, but there's a 30,000 balance on it. How are we gonna figure out this $5,000 balance? Well, at this point, it's super simple. The guy that calls you, now keep in mind, Ford Motor Credit, if little old Ramsey Asphalt is having a financial pro, finance, is in a financial crunch with the rest of the world, you can only imagine what Ford Motor Company is going through. So Ford Motor Company is willing to negotiate just as much as everybody else is willing to negotiate because you take little old Ramsey Asphalt who owes Cal Portland a million dollars, will take Ford Motor Company and they owe Cummins Ninjas, they owe them $10 billion. It's just, everybody's in the same boat here. So when these guys would call me from Motor, Ford Motor Company and they would say, hey Scott, we sold your truck for 25, you owe 30, how are we gonna figure out the balance? And I say, well, how would you like to figure out the balance? Now this is where my sales training came in is I would I'd throw a porcupine back at him and I would say, how would you guys like to handle the balance? I would say, we have, the way I look at it, we have, really, we have three options here. We have option A, I only have a certain amount of cash. If you can discount that 5,000 for me, I'll write you a check right now and overnight it to you. That's one option. Or B, we, we figure out how we can get this truck paid off. Give me a little bit of a discount and we'll get it paid off over the next year. Or option three, if you want the full $5,000, uh, if you wanna get paid that full $5,000, then what we need to do is we need to structure a, a payment over the next 24 months. I'll tell you guys in all honesty and in all sincerity, when, when I went back to my vendors, uh, not my vendors, when I went back to my creditors and I, and I owed them sums of, large sums of money, they were always willing to negotiate and they were always willing to work with me. There was only in, in, in two, during this hard struggle time, there, during the rough times, there was only two people that were, were willing, that were unwilling to work with me. And I, I, and I, I'm sad to say that even to this day, I still owe those company money, but we're talking 15 years later and we've reached out to them several times. How can we get you paid? And I don't know, they just f fell off the radar, but everybody I owed money to, they were all willing to negotiate. And a lot of times Ford Motor Company would come back and say, hey, Scott, you owe us $5,000. We don't really want to string this out for more than six months, or we really don't want to string this thing out at all. You owe us $5,000. If you'll write us a check for $1,500, bucks, we will call it a day and you're off the hook. Oh, done. I mean, I'll find $1,500. I don't know how I'm going to find $1,500 because I don't have two quarters to rub together, but I'll find $1,500. And we did. We absolutely did. Um, also during this time, I enlisted the, uh, the help of a consolidation company called Corporate Turnaround. I give a shout out to those guys. I still talk to those guys. We email. Um, they really helped me get through those hard times because they were on board with Ramsey Asphalt and they were on board with keeping Ramsey Asphalt in business. And they structured such a plan to where they helped me. I, I, did, I did some negotiations with, with my creditors and my vendors but corporate turnaround really, really, really saved my bacon because their whole philosophy is, Scott, you go out and build roads. 
let us deal with the money part. And they did. And they, they, they did a beautiful job. They kept me in business and they got everybody paid except for the two people that refused to refused to work with, with corporate turnaround. And, um, but the nice thing with corporate turnaround is they have a, a forever policy. So if those two companies ever came, come back and say, hey, we want, we finally, here we are 15 years later, we want our money, corporate turnaround will step back in and they'll help me out. Not that I really need them at this point, but they would help me out. And um, actually corporate turnaround, you know, they're kind of obligated because I paid them, I paid them for the settlement stuff. And so they would come back in and help me out and um, we would get those guys settled out. So anyway, I think I've rambled on long enough about that. So that took us from 2003 to 2008, 9, 10, really the rough part. And just really all I can say, guys, is at the end of the day, if it, we're not in any kind of a recession now. Here we are in 2022, winding out 2022. We're not in any kind of a real recession. There's still plenty of work out there. But if you ever find yourself, if you ever get a bad job where uh, your estimator under, undercut it or whatever, continue working hard and just make good on your promises. If, if you lose $10,000 on a job, let your vendor know, hey, you, 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 you ate your bacon on the job and you really need some, some extra time to pay your bill. And it's gonna hurt your ego and it's really super embarrassing, but you'll be surprised at how, how well people respond when you're just honest with them. Just be straight with people. Hey, we had a bad fourth quarter. We had, not, we had, a, bad four, we had a bad fourth quarter. We're going into the winter time. We, we, we owe more than we have coming in. Our receivables and payables are upside down. Can you work with us? And you'll be surprised at how willing people are to work with you. So I'm ending up uh, this episode. Uh, and uh, subscribe, thumbs up, whatever you guys want to do. But more importantly, comments, questions. This is what's fueling these episodes. This is what's fueling this podcast. That's what's fueling this, this YouTube. That's what's fueling me is, is, is the questions that come in and anything we can do to help you guys. So... Anyway, shout out to all you guys. Once again, thank you to the City of Santa Maria Library and this beautiful spot, the beautiful office. I feel like, uh, like Shane said, uh, I feel like the President of the United States sitting here in this big old huge conference table. So uh, another episode closes out. Ramsey Rhodes rocks. Uh, and we'll talk to you guys later. Bye.